Chapter 1 In the fog, there was a vision. Vicki, lift your hands. Okay, Lord. Sitting on the second row, a woman I didn't know began to sob quietly and mumble something unintelligible. With my hands lifted up, I continued to sing as I stood before the small group gathered at that weekend retreat in northern Missouri about seven years ago. The fact that I didn't know what the Lord was doing was not important. What mattered was that I be obedient to what he asked me to do. For the sake of anonymity, I will call the woman Paula. When I was able to speak with her after the service, she told me what she had seen during the song. She said that when I lifted my hands, an angel stepped into the room behind me. Looking up toward heaven, the angel also had uplifted hands. The angel seemed to be holding something large and round. As I sang, the round space the angel held filled with a light fog. In the center of the fog, a vision appeared in which a woman wearing sweats stood before the throne of God. Unwilling to lift her head because of the deep shame she felt for the life she had lived, the woman stood there crying before the King of Kings. She was deeply humbled as she waited in the presence of God, for she was one who had been a prostitute, a drug addict, and an alcoholic. Molested as a child and raped as a teenager and adult, she had gone on to marry and divorce five men. She killed five of her babies while they were still in her womb and didn't bother to raise the three living children she'd given birth to, leaving them with their fathers instead so that she could do whatever she wanted with her life. She had cheated, lied, stolen, and damaged many lives and had tried just about every sin there was to try. And although she had finally surrendered her life to God, loving and serving Him for the rest of her days, the awareness of her sins left her feeling completely undeserving of being in His presence. For here in this place was the one who knew her even more intimately than she knew herself. And he loved her still. Extending his hand, the Lord placed it under her chin and lifted her head. Gently, the father asked her, My child, why do you weep? With a sorrowful heart, the woman responded, I'm not worthy, Lord. God smiled. As he extended his hand in front of the woman, her clothes changed into a beautiful, long, white gown. Simple in design and illuminated by the light of God, the flowing garment had a satin ribbon around the waist. There were no shoes on her feet. The Lord knows how she loves to be comfortable. God wiped her tears away, then raised his hand above her head, and a beautiful crown of light appeared. Laying his hands upon her shoulders, he turned her around to face all the host of to face all the host of heaven and spoke these words, This is an heir to a king. The atmosphere in that holy place filled with shouts of joy, praise, and singing. Amazed by the grace and compassion of the Lord, the woman humbly stood before them. As the vision ended, the Lord then spoke these words of counsel for the woman. He said, Share this vision often. Let go of your pride and stop trying to prove to man who you are. You belong to me, and you do not have to explain yourself when you are led by me. Go and share the good news, witness in the name of my son, and you shall see God in all his glory and power. Amen. As I sat with Paula and listened to the vision, I was humbled once again by the profound love that the Lord has for us. Tears poured from our eyes as Holy Spirit ministered, and she told me what she had seen that night. The power of the presence of God was so strong that we couldn't stop crying. It was such a beautiful gift from him. Just look at the love of the Father who wants and deserves praise. He asked me for a small sacrifice of praise when he told me to lift my hands as I sang that evening. By willingly obeying him, he strengthened Paula's faith and mine and gave her the vision. He has blessed thousands of lives as that vision has been told to men and women who believed they could not be forgiven because their sins were too great. He's blessed countless others who had given up on loved ones, thinking they would never change. He is absolutely and completely beautiful, and I love him beyond my greatest ability to express it with mere words. There is one more thing I want to share. I am the woman in the vision who stood before the throne of God. Glory to the Lamb who was slain for me. Hi, my name is Vicki Adkins, and I am so happy to be here with you today. Um, I 
have looked forward to this time when, when I would get to share just a little bit about this book. Um, it's entitled Only Believe, and I actually wrote this book back in 2006, so it's been around for a little while. But uh, the thing that I just love about it is that even though it's very small and a quick read, it's just got a powerful punch in it to help people uh, come into a greater understanding of their walks with the Lord. Perhaps you know someone or perhaps you are someone who has struggled and just can't seem to quite get things stabilized in your life or you know someone like that who you just you look at a loved one or a friend and think when are they ever going to get it figured out well this is a powerful little tool and so I want to encourage you uh, I want to encourage you to get it you know I think back on all of the times that I tried so hard to get things right and just kept messing up over and over and over kept failing time and again and even today there's still things in my life I'm working on. I haven't met one single believer who isn't still working on something in their lives. But I want to talk to you just a little bit about what happens to us. And, and in doing so, I'll, I'll just refer to one of the chapters in the book. It's called, Who's in the Cockpit? Um, this was a dream that I had many years ago one night. It was actually on the last time I came back to the Lord. I came back to the Lord for the last time in 1988. I could do anything for, oh, my cycle was maybe three years at a time. I could walk with the Lord for three years. I could be married for three years. I could keep a job for three years. But then I just would rebel and go right back into the world. And as I said earlier, I would just get worse each time I went back out there. But... Uh, when I came back in 1988, I didn't come back until I knew I wouldn't walk away from him again. I remember he was tapping me on the shoulder, so to speak, in the spring of that year. And he would come to me from time to time in dreams and, and, uh, and uh, through the call of loved ones who would you know, just want to encourage me to come back to the Lord. But I was so full of pride and so much rebellion that... Uh, this last time I knew that I wasn't coming back until I knew I'd never walk away again because I knew that if I came back one more time to the Lord and I left him again I knew that I would die there was no doubt in my mind I would end up dead so I wrestled with that all that spring and summer of 1988 and then in the fall I finally said yes I remember telling him at the time uh, that it wasn't that I was saying no it was until I finally made the decision to say yes it wasn't that I was saying no because I didn't think that I could conquer the enemy Satan I knew what I needed to conquer was myself I needed to conquer my will I needed to know that I I was no matter what I felt, no matter what I experienced, no matter what happened in my life, once I came back to the Lord, I had to know that I would never walk away again. And so you see, it wasn't the, the devil I was fighting. It was Vicki. It was the pride. It was the self-will. It was literally a thing, and I think so many of us, that's the case for so many people, that uh, we want to blame the devil, we want to blame Satan or something somebody does or says or the circumstances we've been through in our lives. We want that to be the reason that we say, I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't help doing what I do. I do it because I've had all these bad things happen. Well, that's a lie. But <clears throat> maybe bad things have gotten us to the place where we are. But the fact of the matter is God's given us this incredible gift called uh, free will. And we get to choose. We get to choose, beloved. Is it going to be the Lord or is it going to be the world? Are we going to serve God, surrender our lives, and follow Him? Or are we going to serve ourselves and actually, in the process, serve Satan? <clears throat> so anyway, I, I knew that I would not be able to come back to Him until I had conquered my will. And I remember the day that I did. By that point in time, I was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. Um, I was sick most of the time with bronchitis because of that. I was drinking every single day. I was addicted to prescription drugs. I was really in bad shape. And so I knew when I came back that I had to start getting rid of these things. The first thing I laid down was the alcohol. 
I remember at the time I was living with another alcoholic and while he was out of town I painted the inside of his house in dark blue and uh, for three days and three nights all I did was paint and shake all night long and all day long coming going through withdrawal from the alcohol um, and then four months later I laid down the cigarettes <laughs> It's funny how that's probably for a lot of people that's the hardest thing to lay down of the physical sins that we find ourselves in. I laid down the cigarettes and I remember sitting on the couch for three days crying my eyes out and saying, I'm doing this for you, Jesus. I'm doing this for you, Jesus. I got to tell you, though, the Lord was quiet and waited on me. But I know now and have known for a long time, I didn't do it for Jesus. I did it for me. I did it because there was a wall that stood between the Lord and me. And that wall was a wall of sin. The things that I felt, it wasn't, how do I say this? The tobacco itself, even though it's really not good for us, it's more than that. It's that it's an act of rebellion. It's that God's given us a temple, our bodies, and that when we fill our bodies with things that are damaging, we and uh, that are destructive to us, that are destructive to us intentionally, then we're in rebellion. And that was the thing the Lord taught me a long time ago, that that was one of the first ways I would go back into rebellion when I would leave him over the course of, the, of my lifetime. It would always be the cigarettes I'd pick up first. So when I quit smoking four months later, after I came back to him, I remember thinking that if I just got rid of the alcohol and the tobacco and the prescription drugs and cleaned up my language and stopped cussing all of the time, I remember thinking that was all that uh, I had to do and then I was going to be all okay. I wouldn't be a sinner anymore. I'd be clean. And, <laughs> and I think it's so interesting how God was so quiet during that time because beloved God is a holy God and he wants a holy bride for his son. And so, just like Jesus talks about in the scriptures, not the things that go into us that defile us, it's the things that come out of us. Well, what was coming out of me in my life was anger and hate and bitterness and lies and rebellion in every way. There was no peace in me. There was no stability. I lived my life by my emotions. I remember... Um, and there's a testimony about that in the book. There's a, a dream that the Lord gave me about that. Many years ago when I first came back, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was flying an airplane. And in this plane, uh, I wasn't seated in the cockpit, though. I was flying on the nose of the plane. As I thought up, the plane would go up. And as I thought down, it would go down. And I was just flying all over the place. And then I caught myself thinking down more and more and more. And eventually with my thoughts I landed that plane in a concentration camp and it was the enemy's camp there were people walking around in military uniforms and uh, I knew they were the enemy there were really really high fences with uh, razor wire across the top it was extremely difficult to get that plane back up and out of that concentration camp and then the dream ended the Lord taught me that when we live our lives by our emotions and our emotions rule us there's no stability in us our emotions are there for us to enjoy and they serve a purpose but they're not to be what we live our lives by and for us to be able to mature in our walks with the Lord we have to learn how to control our emotions our spirits should be in charge of us not our emotions not our flesh so anyway, that's one of the testimonies that's in the book. And it's by his love and because of his love that he brings correction. It's because of his love that he pours out gifts. It's because of his love that he calls us into uh, an intimate relationship with him. It's because of his love that he trusts us to be in the lives and puts us in the lives of people who are broken and hurting. It's because of, he of his love that he draws people to us that want him and maybe don't even know that's what they're looking for. It's because of his love that he allows circumstances that are painful to occur in our lives and in the lives of the ones we love. 
He is truly a sovereign God. And his plans are way more powerful, deeper, and far-reaching than we can possibly imagine. So if you have become discouraged, if you've lost your hope, then get your fire back because God hasn't given up and don't you give up either. Welcome back. I've been uh, sharing with you a little bit about the book I wrote called Only Believe. And um, just want to take a few minutes because I know that there are a lot of people that feel like they have just gone too far and you may know someone like that or you may even be that person. You may feel like you have just, your life has just been such a mess that or maybe you're trying to walk with the Lord and you just keep getting discouraged and feeling like things are never going to change and when are you going to get this figured out and why won't God help you? You know, a lot of times the things that we go through in our lives that uh, just keep happening over and over and over, a lot of times those things come because we haven't surrendered ourselves to the Lord. We may be... We may be someone, uh, you may be someone that walks with him every day, but you just keep getting frustrated and, and maybe even angry because it seems like no matter how hard you try, uh, things just aren't working out. Beloved, I got to tell you, the Lord said that in this life we would have trouble. We would have problems. Things are going to happen. And maybe you know that and maybe you don't, but I'll just say this. He also went on to say, don't let those things overwhelm you because I've overcome the world. He's such a good father and such a good savior and such a good friend. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother, as the word says. He is faithful. His promise to us is that the work that he started in us when we belong to him, he is faithful to see that work through to completion, to the coming of, uh, of, uh, of the time when we will see him face to face. So even if you are having a hard time and you're feeling like you're just not getting anywhere, you continue to press in. And if you're someone who has always wanted to find a way to have peace and joy in this life, no matter what's going on, if you are so tired of just doing the thing that makes you feel good just for a minute, and then you feel just horrible again about yourself. This is a powerful time in your life. This is an opportunity for you to be able to lay all of that stuff down and say to the Lord, I know that I something has to change. I know that I'm a sinner. I know I do stuff I shouldn't do. I'm so tired of being tired of who I am. So I'm going to give my life to you, and I'm asking you, Father God, to take this life. I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and I just surrender myself to you. I ask you to have your way. I don't know how to live this life on my own, and everything I do seems to make a mess. So please forgive me for my sins, and please come and live with me, Lord. Teach me how to live a life that is rich in mercy and grace and love and peace, regardless of my circumstances, in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, when I first came back to the Lord, peace was, of everything, peace was the most important thing to me, to be able to have genuine peace in my heart and in my mind. To not be walking around constantly just distressed or worried or afraid or... Uh, discouraged or anything but to truly have peace in my life no matter what was going on that was that was probably the most important thing to me when I first came back because I was a mess I know there are a lot of people out there like that right now and especially in the world we live in there's so much there's so much going on we're in that time now where where the Bible talks about how they will call evil good and good evil. Things that uh, 
things that God considers sin are now being just touted as being wonderful and things that are good and right and holy and uh, on God's heart are being called evil in the world we live in. So these circumstances we, we find ourselves in in these days now, they're not, they're not going to get better before they get worse. But we don't have to be afraid and we don't have to be discouraged. We, ha we are called to only believe the Lord for who he is, for who he says he is. He equips us. If we are willing to allow him to do that, he will equip us to help us know how to live our lives in such a way that we find that peace and that joy and that confidence in knowing that regardless of our circumstances, he is always there and he will always make a way for us to be able to come into uh, a deeper relationship with him, uh, to come back to him when we fall, when we sin, that his mercy endures forever and that his grace is there to allow us to be, for those times we don't get it right, his grace is extended to us as we keep pressing in to grow and to mature, to become everything He's created us to be. I, uh, I want to encourage you to, to visit my website. Uh, you can order the book there. Um, and by doing that, just go to warringwell.com. It's W-A-R-R-I-N-G, well.com. Um, I'm sure I'm going to have it across the bottom of the screen. And uh, you can contact me there. I would love to be able to hear your testimony if you have something you want to share. If you need prayer, uh, if you go to the shop page, you can find not only Only Believe, but you can find another little book I've written entitled Unshakable Faith. Um, and uh, just tell you very, very quickly about that one. That one, that book came into being because I had an experience one time many years ago in which I... Um, I saw two people that I love very dearly. It was, it was a dream or a vision. Honestly, now I cannot remember. But it was probably about seven or eight years ago. I saw two people I love very dearly standing on scaffolding. And I knew that uh, the executioner was there. And this was before all of this stuff about ISIS and everything had made its way into this nation in, uh, in my understanding. I didn't know people still actually beheaded people. And in this experience, these two people that I love were being told that they were to either deny that Jesus is the Christ, to deny him completely, or that they would have their heads cut off. While well, I knew, standing there watching them, I knew, I know these two people that I love them dearly. I love them deeply and profoundly, and I knew there was no way they would deny that. Their love for God is strong. And that was the end of the experience. Um, so when I, when I uh, came out of that experience, I, I said to the Lord, Father, I need you to do whatever it is that needs to be done in me so that my faith is absolutely unshakable, regardless of what I see going on, that I, uh, that I cannot be shaken. So that's where, that, that's where that little book came about. That's also on the website, uh, on the shop page. And then I have some uh, other things on there that... Uh, are available if anyone is interested in purchasing them. I just want to tell you we are in such a powerful time in history right now. You haven't been forgotten. You haven't been. Um, you haven't been cast aside. No matter what it is you've been through, no matter what it is you've done, there is this beautiful gift that the Lord gave us, and it's called repentance. If Jesus hadn't died, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be able to repent. If he hadn't come and lived a perfect, sinless life and then hung on that tree and died for us and then rose from that tomb, there's no way any of us would have any hope of ever being with the Father again. But he did. And the gift that he gave us, actually a couple of things I want to say. One gift that he gave us, that he promised his disciples when he left, he said, I have to go away. If I don't go away, then the comforter won't come. But if I go, I'll send him, and he will be with you and in you, so that you don't even have to have a human being teach you. If need be, everything you need to learn can be, can be learned through, uh, from the Holy Spirit. The other thing I want to say is that 
this beautiful gift of repentance, which is a dirty word in our culture nowadays. People don't want to have to repent. They feel like they can do anything they want and it's okay. But we serve a holy God. And no matter what we think, there will come a day when each one of us who's ever been born will stand before him. And he will call into account the things that we have done. And we'll have that opportunity if if we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, if we have laid our lives down truly and surrendered ourselves to him, not to say that we're all perfect because we're all still working on it, but if we continue to, to walk with him day by day, line upon line, precept upon precept, as it says in the word, then we have the assurance of knowing that his beautiful grace, which extended to us the gift and continues to extend to us the gift of repentance, to be able to turn back and say, I am so sorry and I am changing my mind about these things that I've been doing or saying or thinking and now Lord I'm going to turn to you and do as you would have me do what a precious gift that is then the blood of Jesus Christ is able to wash us completely clean if you have someone you need to forgive then do it it doesn't matter what they've done to you or to anyone you love or to anyone that you uh, uh, even people you don't know it doesn't matter you forgive. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely forgive people. Let go of all of the um, hurts and the anger and all of those things. Let yourself be washed completely clean in the blood of the Lamb so that you can hear Him clearly. God loves you with truly an everlasting love. And he, if He didn't want you, He wouldn't be touching you to come to Him. You know, I've, I've met so many people who, like I said before, have thought that the Lord couldn't possibly want them. Beloved, if you're wondering if he wants you, the answer is yes. Because the word says nobody comes to him unless Holy Spirit draws them. So if you are being drawn just even to wonder if he wants you, then please know he does. God bless you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Again, my name is Vicki Adkins. I hope to be hearing from you soon and just want to say to you, God bless you. You are, you are so very deeply loved and you can do this. Bye-bye.